So anyways, we want to now get into the Word. You guys are thankful that we, we trust in God's Word, the Scriptures here. We want to open it every week. You can open your smartphone or you got to buy I got this old-fashioned one with pages still. I like the sound of it flipping open and feeling it kind of heavy in my hands. Sometimes I carry it around with me. I want people to see it still. Um, sometimes I look at my phone. You don't know if I'm checking sports scores or if I'm actually reading the Bible. So I actually bring my Bible so you know what's up. But uh, we're going through the Gospel of Luke. And we're so thankful that God wants to speak for Himself. Yeah, I've got some opinions, and hopefully they help you. Hopefully they're inspired by prayer. But uh, at the end of the day, we want to hear what God says. So we go through books of the Bible at a time. We've been doing it for a while. We have a teaching team, especially on off-COVID years. We've had much more rotation of voices. We had Elizabeth teach last week. That was awesome. Thanks, Elizabeth, for teaching. And Pastor Randy, and I get to share the word this morning. I come to you uh, with a bit of a burden My heart is heavier than it usually is, and I can't get it to go away. The more I pray and worship, I still have this burden as I reflect on what's transpiring in our nation, in this country. Uh, I can't make it go away and just hyper-optimism over it. I think it's kind of grievous in some senses. I know you probably see some good things happening in our nation. I do too. But uh, I think the thing that grieves me lately is that I see this tactic of God's enemy, Satan, using this uh, tactic of division and drawing false lines. I wonder how many of you guys see that, sense that, observe that, or feel that, that the society around us is trying to draw lines. And it's this tactic. You might think it's just a coincidence, but it's actually a tactic. It's actually a strategy of sometimes people in politics, let's be honest, definitely a strategy of God's enemy to draw these kind of false lines that really aren't lines that God is necessarily drawing, and to pressure people to take a stand on the side of the line they want. And if we take the stand that people want, it comes with this sense of moral eliteness, moral rightness. I feel good because the media, the secular mainstream media and the government or whoever, my university professor told me to take this stance here. And it makes me at least momentarily feel like I'm good, I'm on the right side of the line. But really what it's doing is taking away this thing God put in us, our brain, to have intelligent conversations, to observe a lot of factors that go into complicated issues, to look at God's Word and see what it speaks to in these issues, to look at it from different angles and approaches and be able to actually just kind of stand there and think and pray and have conversations. And that part is leaving in our society in a lot of ways. I don't know if you sense it. If you don't, I'm kind of happy for you because you live in a bubble and you're not like feeling what most people these days are feeling, especially the young people. But I'm really, I'm scared. I'm scared for the younger generation that's being brainwashed to just take whatever is being fed and to receive it as this is what it means to be a good person. Take this stand for this or against this. Don't have a conversation. Don't, Don't listen to different voices. Don't listen to what uh, God's word says. Don't listen to what your parents say. I, I'm just, it, it, it grieves me. It grieves me. And I think the thing that grieves me the most is not that it's taking away intelligent conversation and dialogue and uh, respectful debate. Yeah, that, that makes me sad too. I think the thing that just is the most grievous is that it is Satan's tool behind it all to distract people from the real line. How many of you guys know there is a real line? And I'm sorry, whoever you are, I don't care what position you hold in this country or in any country, you do not hold the right to draw the ultimate line. God does. God gets to draw the lines. And that's my title today, Jesus Draws the Lines. And as we're going through Luke chapter 12, we see Jesus, it appears that he's drawing lines again between this stance and this stance. But really, I think he's just describing in greater detail what the real line is and what it really looks like to side with God, to side with Jesus. And I'll tell you what, I, I believe in voting. I believe, I, I'm, I've been, this is the most informed I've ever been about politics. I never was that caring before this year. Now I care a little more. Uh, I see it affecting our lives. I think it's going to affect our, you know, freedoms and such. Uh, I, I definitely think there's a lot at stake. So yeah, I vote. Yeah, I want to stay informed. But how many of you guys know eternity is a lot longer than four years? And four-year terms are great, but eternity is a long time. And that's the real issue. And Satan is distracting people to think if they're on the right side for whatever, four years, two years, two months, two weeks, the flavor of the day on their 
social media feed that they are morally upstanding, righteous, and in a good place. And all the while, Satan's deceiving people to be on the wrong side of the real line that is not leading people down the right path. It's not leading people to Jesus Christ. It's not setting people up for an eternity in God's presence. And that's sad. That should make you sad. It makes me sad. It makes me upset. But I also think it's good uh, for us, church, to have our eyes open, to know that our mission needs to be loud and clear, needs to be so focused. Our mission is not politics. Our mission is Jesus. Our mission is not Republican, Democrat, or any of this stuff. It's Jesus Christ and the gospel. God's word speaks to these things, but at the end of the day, people need to answer to Jesus Christ. And he's not a political leader. He's the king of the universe. He's the most high God. And he is desiring more than anyone can realize for you to stand with him, for you to come to his side, for you to cross over out of death into life, out of darkness into light, out of confusion into clarity, out of what the Bible calls rebellion, or frankly, for some people, blinded religion and into relationship with Jesus. That is the line. That's the ultimate line. I'm uh, wrapping up this introduction before we get into the, the scriptures today. Um, going back in Luke chapter 11, Jesus described the line this way. At one point, he was being harassed by the hostile religious social leaders. And, you know, their religion might be different than the popular spirituality or philosophy of our day and age, but it's the same thing. It always combats Jesus and truth at its core. And Jesus said, look, I don't care where you want me to stand with you. Here's the line. The one who is not with me is against me. Man, I want you to hear those words today. We love people enough to tell them this. Jesus did not say there's a middle ground. He did not say there's a lukewarm, safe spot in the middle. He didn't say there's a nice fence you can walk in the middle. He didn't say you can be (laughs) semi-essentially, partially devoted to Jesus. He said, you're with me or you're against me. And then he describes it differently. He says, the one who does not gather with me scatters. Man, you know what that means? It means that there are two sides. There's a side that is helping people come back to God, their Father, through Jesus Christ. And then there's everyone else who even if you say you're neutral, you say, I'm not doing anything. I'm letting people decide for themselves. If you're not with Jesus, the very default an inherent nature of your life being against God and not with Him is scattering people further from God. And I don't even say that to you today. If you say, I'm a Christian, but I'm just not taking this seriously yet. I'm waiting till I feel more comfortable or till I don't know, I have more money established or whatever your thing is till I get over my hangups. I would say, you need to be careful you're not on the wrong side of gathering and scattering. It is a better side to be with Jesus, gathering people back to God. And if our life is not aligned with Jesus in obedience to Him and surrender and submission to Him, We are scattering people. We're scattering people from God. None of us want to be that guy or that girl. None of us want to be there. Here's the line again. Jesus said in Luke 12, 8, Everyone who confesses me before people, the Son of Man will also confess him before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before people, he will be denied before the angels of God. I don't know if you read this one before. I read this when I was a teenager in public school. and uh, Back then, the pressure wasn't near as intense as it is today to side with whatever popular culture says to side with. But man, I just remember being haunted that, by that, saying, Jesus, I do not want to be someone who has to stand before you and gets denied by you because I denied you. I want to be on the other side. I want to confess you. I want people to know I stand for Jesus. I want people to know I love Jesus. I want people to know I'm sold out for Jesus. This is not up for debate. This is not up for discussion. This is not up for election. I side with Jesus. No one gets to choose that except me. It's decided in my heart, and I proclaim it with my mouth. And Jesus says that's that's a line. That is a line he drew to side with him and confess him. All right, you guys ready for chapter 12? We're starting on 35 today, and Jesus is describing more in detail what this line looks like, because sometimes it's really easy to assume that we're totally on the right side of the line in every way, and to point at people on the other side and not pay attention to maybe where we're not really acting like we're on the right side of the line. Sometimes it's the thing we don't see that gets us, so Jesus today talks about readiness, and he introduces something today that he's not talked about a lot in this gospel, and that's 
Jesus' second coming, his final coming, that he is going to return. Just as Jesus came actually and factually, literally 2,000 years ago from heaven to earth and actually died on a cross and actually was dead for three days and actually rose again a real bodily resurrection and there were eyewitnesses and then ascended to heaven that there actually will be another return of Christ that will be real and literal. This is not figurative or metaphorical. It actually will happen. This is a real deal. It's something the Bible warns through all of uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament prophetically. Uh, the prophets speaking about it. And then Jesus speaking literally about it. And Jesus using figurative language to help us get the picture of this real thing. It's a real thing, and Jesus uh, talks about it today and says that one of these uh, line mentality things is how ready we are or the posture of readiness that we carry in our everyday life for Jesus' return. And i got to be honest, this, sometimes this is a little hard for me to talk about because a couple things. One is uh, I never know when he's going to come. How many of you guys know when the exact hour Jesus is going to come? Anyone know? And I hear a lot of people speculate about it, and I listen to stuff on, you know, the podcasts and the YouTube, and some people have great predictions, and then they die, and they never saw him come. And so it's hard for me, but nevertheless, Jesus wants everyone to have this posture of waiting and watching for him. Even if you die and go to the grave, that's better than not doing that. And there will be a return of Christ for the, and a judgment for the living and the dead. And it is better to go to the grave waiting and watching for the return of Christ. And the opposite is much worse, to not be ready. So anyways, let me just read it to you today. Let's let Jesus speak in my Bible. It's in red letters because these are actual words spoken by Jesus Christ, the Lord. So it says this in verse 35 of chapter 12. It says, Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come come up and wait on them, whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third, and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You too, be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Peter, so actually I'm going to stop there for now. Let's unpack this a little bit. Well, what's Jesus talking about when he says, be dressed in readiness and keeping your lamps lit? Well, Let's talk a little bit what it looked to be dressed at all back then. Let's go back 2,000 years. You probably would not be wearing blue jeans like many of you, kind of a casual church dress code, and uh, you know your, your sandals or your shoes. What you'd probably be wearing is a long robe-like clothing. And this long robe-like clothing, similar to a dress. Men, don't worry. The Bible says uh, you're going to wear a wedding dress someday. I don't know how literal that is, but we will be in a wedding feast with Jesus someday. But the point is back then you wore this robe, man or woman, and uh, it gets in the way if you get busy working, walking, or running. So if you're going to start laboring, cooking, cleaning, farming, or if you need to get somewhere, you had to gird up your clothes. You had to dress your, clo- dress your clothes in readiness, tie this sash around your robe and get it functional so you can do functional things. That's kind of this picture here that Jesus is giving Uh, the disciples and the people he's speaking to, he's saying, I want you to be dressed in readiness. And I want you to keep your lamps lit. And then he goes on to talk about how it's it's like waiting for the master to come back. And he mentions this first watch, second watch, this this matter of watching for God. I want to talk about this readiness for a second. Do you feel like this is a, a passive readiness or an active readiness? I think this is much more of an active readiness, and I think that's really what Jesus is trying to help us see, because like I said, this stuff's kind of hard for me when we talk about watching for Jesus' return, because I read all these things where he says, you don't know the hour he's going to come. Acts says it's not for you to know the time or the epic for Christ's return, Um, yet 
we're supposed to have this active waiting and watching posture. Uh, other, some of your scriptures talk about, it, 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 uh, I think it might, no, it doesn't say that. It's, it implies diligence. And then secondly, this uh, word picture of keeping your lamp lit. I want to unpack that real quick. This lamp, how many of you guys ever seen like Aladdin and the, the genie in the bottle lamp? You guys seen that, the cool little lamp and you rub and the genie comes out? Okay, that actually is kind of what lamps looked like back, go back 2,000 years. They didn't have these uh, Coleman uh, picnic table camping stove light things that you put up here and hook up to your propane, push a button, it goes on. They didn't have these headlamps I have now that are lithium ion and rechargeable. They didn't have batteries. So getting your lamp lit was a bigger deal. You had to fill it with oil. You had to have this wick inside of it that goes from the oil up to this uh, point, you know, where like the genie thing comes out. Sorry to keep referring to that, but that's the best picture I have in my mind right now of this lamp. And it's, real, it's a real issue. If you don't have your lamp ready, you don't have the wick position right, you don't have the right amount of oil in it, and you don't have your sticks ready to make a spark or your stones ready to make a spark, a spark you are not going to have light when you need light. You will not be able to see. Thomas Edison wasn't around yet. There's no lights in people's homes. You either are prepared to light this lamp or you're not. You either have oil in this lamp or you don't have oil in this lamp. You're either going to sleep from 5 p.m. till 8 a.m. or, you know, or be, have kind of a, a, a late start on your day for farmers and an early start to your night for an agrarian society, or you're going to have your lamps ready. And Jesus is saying with this illustration of the wedding feast, and this master going away and coming back, that he wants us to have this readiness and this posture of readiness and this oil of readiness. I want to talk to you a little bit about that and unpack that because I feel like, you know, I've heard, man, is, is it okay for me to just be honest? Like my personal uh, interactions with people, I've met people who say they grew up in churches where there was such a scary fear put on them that Jesus might come back tonight. And even as little kids, they were haunted, laying in bed, scared that Jesus might come back and they might not be ready for one reason or another. And that kind of fear that people have, how many of you guys ever, you ever heard, just kind of a, a very, almost an unhealthy fear put on it. And I, I get that. There can be an unhealthy fear on this, like missing Jesus when he comes back. But I, when I read this, I don't, I don't get that it's an unhealthy fear because I know that there is unhealthy fear and healthy fear. The Bible says in Proverbs that uh, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And the fear of the Lord, uh, the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. There actually is a healthy, holy fear that helps us navigate life rightly. And, you know, the opposite, how many of you guys know the opposite of fear of God is actually, it's not not being afraid, it's fear of man. New, uh, Reality check, newsflash, you're, you're afraid of something right now. It's either fear of man or fear of God, but those are pretty much your two options. And I can hear someone saying, no, I'm not afraid of God and I'm not afraid of people. But I, I, if you unpack it, the Bible's pretty clear. Fear of man is a real snare and the way to get over needing affirmation, needing a, a respect from people, needing to be on the right side of everyone's man-made lines is actually not to uh, stand independent, it's to fear God. It's to fear God, and He gives us wisdom to navigate all these other issues. So I see that with Jesus unpacking this or, or giving this warning, this exhortation to be ready, that there actually is to be some healthy fear in our posture towards Jesus and His second coming. That we're not just to cast off restraint. We're not just to be like these uh, slaves or these servants, these stewards, that may or may not be ready, that may not have the oil, this symbolic substance in our life that actually helps us stay watching and helps us stay alert. This, I think the oil, it's used in other passages, I think it's about intimacy with Jesus. I think it's saying if you stay on, your lamp stays on because you're intimate with God and you treasure the relationship with Him. You're not just scared that He'll miss you, but you're scared that you'll miss any moment with Him in your daily life. You're scared that you'll take your eyes off him for a single second. You're scared that you get distracted by what the world's saying instead of what God's saying. I think that's what he's saying. It's not just watching for his return. It's watching him daily. And yes, it's a posture of readiness for his return, but the focus is not on the return. It's the focus is on Jesus. We're not looking for, say, the Antichrist. We're watching Christ. That's the posture we're to be about. And I think the oil and the lamps lit really speaks to the relationship with him. And I think this is 
really sad. This leads to the next part, is that sometimes as Christians, we really want to be on the safe side, but sometimes we want a shortcut to the safe side. And Peter speaks up and says what all of us Christians sometimes would want to say. That's Peter's job. He says what we don't have the guts to say. He asks the questions that we don't have the guts to ask. And Peter says, Jesus, Lord, are you saying this parable for us or to to everyone else as well? Jesus, are you really warning us that we might miss you? you? Surely, Jesus, you're talking to the other bozos and losers and unbelievers. You're not speaking to us, right? That's, that's the job of Peter. He says the things that we want to say. Sometimes we want to say, God, I'm, I'm good with you, right, God? God, I checked in at church last week. I made it two times out of four. I made it three, four times out of four. I, Jesus, I had my Bible open this week. I, I didn't do any big crazy sins this week. Jesus, we're good, right? We're good. I'm on the right side, right? Like sometimes Peter says the things that we want to say. God, it's the other people that Scripture is talking about, right? You don't want me to actually unpack this. When it says people have pride, that's not me. I don't have pride, do I? I'm on your side, God. When it says I have judgment in my heart, that's for the other people, right? Pete, <laughs> let's read this. So 42, the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that slave says in his heart, if that Christian says in his heart, eh, my master will take a long time to come, and he begins to beat the other slaves, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk, then the master of that slave will come on a day that he does not expect, at an hour that he does not know, and will cut him in two, and assign him a place with the unbelievers." And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accordance with his will will receive many blows. But the one who did not know it and committed acts deserving of a beating will receive only a few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. Stop right there. There's there's some good news and there's some bad news about Jesus' return. Uh, the good news is our Savior is coming back. He's going to make all things new. He's making things right. He's redeeming and bringing and His children back to Him to be with Him forever and eternity. He did it on the cross positionally, uh, and then forever His children will be with Him. The, uh, the more scary news is that there will also be a judgment. And I know people don't like that word this day, but judgment is actually something we should probably unpack more often. It's so easy to say, oh, don't judge me or don't judge this or don't judge that or don't judge but the bible actually speaks about righteous judgment and unrighteous judgment and righteous judgment stems from love and truth and discernment and we're actually supposed to do that that's why if our you know kids are doing something naughty in our house we're supposed to speak up it's why if you know our spouse is our partner is saying things that are nonsense and aren't aligned with god's truth we're lovingly supposed to you know say something it's why if, they're, if people are pressuring you to do something that's wrong, it's against God's truth and God's ways, an employer or whatever, you're supposed to speak up. Even though it might be seen as judgmental, there's righteous judgment and there's unrighteous judgment. And ultimately, even if you do a lot of righteous judgment and you do it all right, judgment still ultimately is not yours or mine. It ultimately belongs to Jesus. And Jesus will judge. And everyone will stand before Jesus, Christians included, Peter included, Pastors included. Everyone gets to stand before Jesus someday and be judged. It's going to be good news if we're forgiven by the blood of Jesus and if we're watching Him with this posture of readiness and preparation. It's going to be good news. It's also going to be scary news and bad news if we cast off restraint and we think it's we're safe because of this or we're safe because of that. I'm woke. I'm religious. I'm spiritual. Whatever the excuse we might have, It might be actually a scary place to be to stand before Jesus if we didn't actually commit to a lifestyle of obeying Him and watching Him, following Him, loving Him and knowing Him and listening to Him. And this kind of unpacks the line. Like I said, it describes the line a little more clearer that this line of being with God or against God, being prepared for God or unprepared for God, that it also has to do with being 
faithful to God or being unfaithful to God. The other word here is sensible. This sensible is idea of being prudent, uh, prudence or wisdom, that we're actually acting in accordance with wisdom or not. And, man, this, the, the picture here really looks like someone who God has put in charge of stuff, given people responsibility. I, think it's, I don't think this is just for, say, pastors and leaders, but I think this should make pastors and leaders have a huge dose of sobriety, that the picture is people have been put in charge of other people, and then knowing that, they think it's okay to take it easy, to eat, drink, and get drunk, to live a lifestyle of licentiousness, and maybe saying things like, well, I'm free in Christ, but really not being responsible with those things or those people God's put in our care. I think another good analogy or a practical example would be in the family, kids that we have, relationships that we have, gifts God's given us to use to serve other people. And, and the master comes back, we weren't expecting him, and he says this, he cuts those people in two and assigns them a place with the unbelievers. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accordance with his will will receive many blows. But the one who did not know it and committed acts deserving of beating, well, he'll receive only a few blows. From everyone who's been given much, much will be demanded. To whom they entrusted uh, much of him, they will ask all the more. So this picture is... This line is getting like described in greater detail that being with Christ is not just about I went to church or I signed a card at youth camp or I said a prayer, but it's really about this whole life given to watching Jesus, listening to Jesus, obeying Jesus, serving Jesus, trusting Jesus, that He actually can do better at this thing called life than we can, that He's actually worthy of our trust, worthy of our obedience, that he actually knows how things work best in this life because he designed it. And there actually should be a sense of healthy fear of God, a healthy sense of reverence for God, a healthy sense of, yeah, you're a little scary if I'm rebelling against you, God. There's, that's okay. If that, that shouldn't be the entirety of our life. And for Christians, there also is an, un, I want to warn you too, there's an unhealthy level of that to fall into. Some of you might be in that today. You're actually, you are actually don't just have a healthy fear of God. You're scared of God. You don't pray. You don't read your Bible. You don't sit quietly before God because you assume He's mad at you. You think about something you did 15, 20 years ago. That's an unhealthy fear of God. First John talks about perfect love casts out fear and talks about the unhealthy fear. God's perfect love is supposed to cast out that unhealthy fear. If you're feeling distance between you and God, the distance is not on His end. He loves you. He does everything he can he, to, to come close to you. Then he gives you the choice. He won't violate your free will. Uh, perfect love casts out fear, casts out that unhealthy fear. So I don't want you to have that. But I think today we need to have a sobriety about which side of the line we're on and what our life is characterized by if we're on God's side. Is it characterized by watching him, by being ready for him, by being diligent with that which he's entrusted to us? those he's entrusted to us, the people in our sphere of influence, our children if you have kids. I think I'm going to stop there for today. Um, man, I told you, I am really grieved because I feel like things are so loud in the mainstream secular media and in the universities, and just in society at large, it's so loud and divisive right now. And, you know, it's up for debate how much is getting better and this and that. I don't want to get into that right now. But the thing that just grieves, I think, the heart of God is that Satan is deceiving people from really seeing the real line. That God wants his kids back. God wants his kids back. And Christians, it's really important that we're not deceived. The world's deceived. Let's not judge them. That, that, let's not judge them. We already know that. They're not opening their eyes to Jesus. We know that leads to all kinds of confusion and rebellion and darkness and deceit. But Christians, it's so important to have our eyes focused on Jesus, and to be watching Him, listening to Him, discerning a right from wrong in all these different issues brought to our attention by having a healthy fear of God. Healthy fear of God can help us understand so much. That's where wisdom starts. 
Um, I wanted to kind of leave you with a question today. I want to leave you with a question. Um, as you reflect on your posture of readiness and preparedness for Jesus Christ and His return that will come, might come in your lifetime. I know a lot of uh, things are lining up that the Bible speaks of. A lot of things, um, I'm not going to go through them right now. That's not what today is about. But I know that many believe that His return could be really soon, and it may. Some of you might see in your lifetime. Some of you might not. Some of you might die, and you'll see it on the other side. But the point is, your life right now, is it marked by a posture of readiness? I want you to really sit, sit and think about that. I want you to take that as your question for the week. Does my life look like uh, there's a posture of readiness and preparedness and watching for God? Am I on the alert? Or does it look like I'm casting off restraint? Does it look like I'm kind of buying time? I want you to really reflect on that. If you have a conversation with a, a close brother or sister in the Lord this week, I think that would be a good thing to talk about. What does your posture of readiness look like an everyday practical life for you. Well, hey, I want you to stand up. I always like to end with an invitation. I just want you to know as intense as this stuff is, God, He is truth and He is love. He actually is love. It's His character. And He loves us enough to tell us the truth because He wants us in His family. And that's what the cross is about. Jesus died on the cross to make you clean and holy and to be able to redeem you back into His family. God wants you more than any political party wants you. God wants you more than any romantic partner wants you. God wants you more than anyone in your family wants you. God wants you more than any employer wants you. God wants you more than the devil wants you. <laughs> it should be good news. God really wants you. And He wants you to come through His Son, Jesus. And I know you might have questions and you know, the news says this, and my teacher said that, and my past says this. And yet, yeah, we have great answers for those questions. I'd love to sit down and answer questions, but many of us started our journey with Jesus with a simple choice to trust Him. We didn't have everything figured out. We just knew there was something right about Jesus, and we didn't want to put Him off any longer. We didn't know how much time we had left, so we said yes to Him, and we don't regret it. None of us regret choosing Jesus Christ. We're not promising you an easy life. We're not promising you no curveballs. We're not promising you no pain or suffering. We're promising you Jesus. That if you say yes to Jesus, you get Jesus. And He's worth it. And He's God. Yes, you get an eternity with Him if you side with Jesus. Yes, you get to be on the right side. Yes, you get to be uh, ethically and morally considered holy and blameless because of what He did on the cross. It's a great feeling. But the be biggest benefit of choosing Jesus is you get Jesus. And if you don't choose Jesus Christ, no matter what they tell you, you don't get Jesus. You don't get unhindered, un, unhindered access to a relationship with Him that is what you were born for, what you were created for. So I want to welcome you to this invitation I give today. If you want to trust Jesus, it starts by trusting Him as your Lord and your Savior and as God. And you can start by saying a simple prayer like this that begins a lifestyle of trust in Jesus. This is how many of us start our life in Jesus. We pray a prayer like this. I'm going to invite you to pray it with me. It goes like this. Dear God, today I choose, I choose to trust you. I don't understand everything. Definitely don't understand everything about the Bible yet, but I'm going to choose to trust you. I believe you died on the cross for me and for my sins. I'm not going to make excuses for my sins in this moment. I'm going to choose to let you forgive all my sins, past, present, and future. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you that you planned to rescue me out of uh, Satan's dominion and out of a life of uh, lostness and confusion and deception. You want me to be part of your family. And God, if you want to come live inside of me, like the Bible says, I open the door of my heart today for you to come live inside me through the Holy Spirit. I'm ready to be your child. I'm ready to follow you. I'm ready to take a side with you. I don't know about all these other sides, but I'm going to take a side with you. And I pray this in sincere faith and genuine truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, if you're in person with us today or you're watching online, just want to celebrate that uh, you, you made it through this message. And if you prayed that prayer of repentance, I'm really excited for you. I'm excited for you to dive into a life in Christ, to get a Bible, to meet Christian friends you can do life with, family with, community with 
to read God's Word, to grow, to learn, to study, to pray, to keep repenting, letting God have every part of your life so it can be set free. And uh, thanks for coming today. Christians, why don't you open your hands? I want to pray a blessing over you. I want to pray for the fear of God, the healthy fear of God to be restored to you in every way. God, thank you for your vibrant church. Thank you, Jesus, that though we may not be the majority, that God, you see us nonetheless as elite in you. And it's not a matter for us to elevate ourselves over other people, but your word says that you've raised us up to heavenly places in Christ. And we're not going to let the world speak over us. They don't get to accuse us or tell us our worth or value or our faults. We're going to receive your identity over us from this point forward. God, we pray we would fear no one but you. Pray we would fear no voice but yours. We pray we would fear no wisdom but yours. God, we pray that your wisdom would take the prominent place in our life And God, your word would cut. It would cut between soul and spirit, between truth and lie, between a bone and marrow, God, that you would judge even the intentions of our heart. God, help us not to point the finger inward. Help us to let you cleanse us on the inside. God, thank you that you have not just told us to try to be the light. You've told us we are the light of the world because your light lives inside of us. God, help us to shine your light to people. Help people to know there still is a real God, and His name's Jesus. He is truth, and He is love. God, we bless your church to be the church this week, to stay strong, to stay encouraged, to be uh, in, in relationship and community. No isolation. This is not a season for being isolated, Christian. You can't do this by yourselves anymore. It's time for good relationships, friendships, small groups, accountability, praying for each other, using edification, uh, to receiving and giving. Uh, We pray for your church to be generous to one another, to uh, to, to sacrifice our expense for the good of one another. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.